All the examples of cell-cell signaling that we've looked at so far have been cells within an organism. But what I want to do in this video is point out that you can also have cell-cell signaling between different organisms, and even between different unicellular organisms. And so what we have here, these are pictures of yeast cells. Yeast are unicellular eukaryotic organisms, which means they have, they have a nucleus, and they are officially fungi. And what you see happening in this, in this picture right over here, it looks like you have a second yeast cell budding off of the first one. This happens fundamentally through mitosis. But yeast can actually reproduce in two different different ways. It can reproduce asexually through mitosis like this, but it can also reproduce sexually. And that's where we're going to talk a little bit about signaling between the cells. And they do this with mating factors. And this is just an interesting discussion of yeast generally. So if you start with a yeast cell, so this is a yeast cell right over here, and this is a diploid yeast cell. So it has its full it has its full complement of chromosomes. So it's going to have 16 16 pairs 16 pairs of chromosomes or 32 total chromosomes that's a diploid so through mitosis it could split apart and it would do so like this the 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 one that buds off for most for most uh, species of yeast will be smaller although there's some that kind of do more even mitosis but through mitosis you could through mitosis you could produce two diploid two diploid yeast cells just like this so all of these characters all of these characters right over here are diploid and actually since just to stress that they are eukaryotes let me draw a little nuclear membrane in here but it can also it can also divide through meiosis so this is mitosis right over here mitosis right over here help produce these two but you can also go through meiosis meiosis. And if we go through meiosis, we're going to pr produce four cells, and what's interesting about these is that these will have will come in one of two varieties and you could view these as the sex of these yeast cells. So they can either be in the type A variety. So let's make these two type A. So that's a type A. That's a type A right there, or they could be in the type alpha variety. So this is a let me do this in a different color. So this is a type alpha and this is another type alpha. And all four of these are going to come through meiosis from this original diploid cell. And since we went through meiosis, each of these are going to be haploid. So these are all going to be haploid. So this is going to be 16 chromosomes total. 16 chromosomes. chromosomes each of them so they're all going to be they're all going to be haploid and in fact each of these can to some degree uh, live a life of their own and continue to reproduce through mitosis that's worth pointing out that's interesting you normally wouldn't associate sex cells if we think about humans you wouldn't associate you wouldn't think that sperm cells would be able to replicate on their own or egg cells would be able to replicate on their own but in the case of yeast they actually can so this this type A cell could turn into through mitosis it could turn into two type A cells. So this is just all interesting background mitosis. So even the products of meiosis can then mitose themselves. So this that's all interesting. But this is all the setup to think about how they actually signal. Because these these haploid cells that are produced as a byproduct of meiosis, these are these right over here, they all came from the original ancestor, uh, which is actually fairly typical when we're talking about reproducing and kind of pseudo sexually reproducing yeast cells, but they don't have to. The, maybe one of the type alphas came from another uh, ancestor. But what happens is they each release what's called mating factors, or you can consider them to be mating pheromones. So this type A right over here, it's going to produce it's going to produce the type A mating factors and it's going to release them into the space around it. So it's releasing those type A mating factors. And then the alphas are going to release the type alpha mating factors. So I'll do that in this orange just brown color. So they're going to release the type alpha mating factors. And what happens is each type has receptors for the other types factors. So so this the type A is going to have receptors for the type alpha for the type alpha and it's going to be in all over the outside of the cell and the type alpha is going to have type receptors for the type A. 
receptors, let me do that in orange, it's uh, going to have receptors for the type A. Let me just draw it like that. That's not exactly what they look like, or actually nowhere close to what they look like, but it gives you a sense of things. It gives you a sense of things. And as through these receptors, it starts bonding a lot of, say we're on the alpha cell right over here, it starts bonding to a lot of these, these mating pheromones, these mating factors. Then the yeast cell itself, it doesn't move, but it starts growing in that direction. It starts growing in the direction where it says, hey, I'm sensing a lot of this mating factor. So it starts growing in, in this direction. and starts doing something like that. And the corresponding thing is going to happen for the type A cell. It's going to have the alpha factors attach onto it. And because of that, it says, oh, okay, I'm sensing, and you know, once again, the, the, the factor is the ligand. It attaches to the receptor. That's the sensing part. Then you have signal transduction. And it's actually a, it's, it's not too dissimilar from the MAP-K, the, the, uh, the MAP-K transduction pathway that we talk about in other videos. And then the response the cell has is once again to start growing in the direction of where it, fi where it seems that these mating factors are coming from. And these, this kind of elongation, these outgrowths of these haploid yeast cells, they're actually called schmoos. So that right there, that is a schmoo. And you might say, where did that come from? Well, it came from this character right over here, which was a cartoon character in the, in, in the middle 20th century. And I'll, you know, if, if you were, well, uh, it, well, it, 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 I'll, I'll, we'll just avoid any snickering in, over the course of this video. But that's what it looks like. And as they grow to each other, that actually allows them to join together and form another diploid, another diploid yeast cell. So if this process were to continue, if this process were to continue, these two schmoos will join together, and the, the genetic makeup joins together, and so we could get another diploid cell. And now this diploid cell is going to have a kind of a new, a new combination of DNA, so it, it could benefit from some of the variation of sexual, sexual reproduction. This is diploid. Although for yeast cells, they're, they're, they've like studied it because it, it's not clear that these are necessarily coming from a com separate gene pools. These actually could have the same ancestor molecule. So it is a bit of an open question in biology of why do they have you know, this type of sexual reproduction, especially when they're coming from, you know, when, when these are essentially sibling cells as a byproduct of meiosis. But anyway, the whole point of this is one, to, to appreciate kind of these fascinating things that are happening even at the level of yeast cells, and that you do have cell-cell signaling not just within an organism, but across organisms, especially, or even unicellular organisms.